Good afternoon, I'm Dave Norton from Discovering New England History, and today we're going to continue on with uh, episode two of the uh, New England Abolitionists, and we're going to be uh, taking a trip on the uh, Underground Railroad. <laughs> so we'll start with uh, slide number one, and that's called the Abolition of Movement, and we've already uh, discussed in the first chapter Harry Beecher Stowe. And we're going to move on with some of these other uh, influential people that were involved in the abolition and movement in New England. We'll go to the next slide. Now, the Fugitive Slave Act, we discussed that, was passed in 1850. And you got to remember, up in the free states in the North, uh, all escaped sla slaves were, upon capture, to be returned to their masters. And it was illegal to harbor runaway slaves. And they had a stiff penalty of six months in prison plus a thousand dollars fine. Of course, that thousand dollars is quite a bit of money uh, back back then. Now there were 23 known safe houses in New England, and we're just uh, a lot of historical societies are coming across these and they're trying to verify all these. And uh, we'll be talking about quite a few of these that I found throughout New England. And the whole idea was that the Underground Railroad was formed to help the uh, fugitive slaves. Um, escape to freedom, uh, either in the free states, but primarily into Canada, where they didn't have all these, uh, uh, have to have this Fugitive Slave Act um, enforced. So we'll go to the next slide. Here's one of the main houses in Rhode Island, the Charles Perry House, Westerly, Rhode Island. And a lot of the slaves, they would uh, stow away or they would um, have a sympathetic captain on a ship. And a lot of them came from uh, ports in uh, Virginia, and they would come up the coast, and they would land all along the coast of New England. Now, Rhode Island, uh, they would land down in, um, in the Newport area, and, um, or in Westerly, th that whole area there. And this was one of the main uh, safe houses, if you will. It's called the Charles Perry House, and it's in Westerly, Rhode Island, where most of all of the uh, slaves passed through at least when they um, went through Rhode Island. So we'll go to the next picture. Now from there in Westerly, they made their way up to Valley Falls, Rhode Island. There's a picture of the uh, house over there on the, on the right. And a woman by the name of Elizabeth Buffum Chase, uh, she had a house there. And she was what they call a conductor on the Underground Railroad. And this was one of the central points in New England where a lot of the sl slaves came. And typically they would only stay in a house like this for maybe overnight and then move on to the, the next night and another group would come in. And that's how they would do it uh, uh, before the Civil War, probably from 1830 up until 1861, the uh, Underground Railroad was uh, enforced. We'll go to the next one. Now the Underground Railroad, they had uh, significant terms for these. It had what they call stations, station masters, conductors, and passengers. And you can say, well, w what do they mean? <laughs> okay, so stations are the buildings that sheltered the uh, fugitive slaves. And basically they were things like uh, carriage houses and things like houses. Station masters were those who fed and clothed the sl slaves. So typically they were the owner of the property uh, of any of these houses, any of these buildings. Conductors, that's another group, were those who transported the slaves from place to place, from one house to another house, secretly at night. And the runaway slaves were called passengers on the Underground Railroad. And the, ex the escape plan was they were hiding in private homes by day and moved north by night to either, either the free states, because they were coming from the south, or primarily to Canada. So we'll go to the next picture. And believe it or not, here I did some research. I'm originally from Connecticut, and I, and I couldn't believe it. I'm from the, the town right next to here in uh, Farmington, Connecticut. And the Underground Railroad in Connecticut now, uh, when they would, uh, would come through, this was called the Grand Central Station of the Underground Railroad. Of all the states in New England, Farmington, Connecticut had the most houses in the Underground Railroad. And you can see I just picked six of these. The, almost like the entire town was involved in, uh, in uh, hiding the uh, fugitive slaves. 
and it was centered around a congregational church in the town. It, it was a, quite an amazing operation. And what we're going to do here is now I'm going to show you each one of these houses because they're really, really significant and really uh, quite, quite interesting, each one in its own way. So we'll go to the next slide. This is what they call the Smith Coles House. And you can see these houses are very nice. Now, what, what, what would happen here is, at night, of course, the uh, conductors of the Underground Railroad would move the slaves from, from house to house on their way up north. And a lot of these houses were set uh, in somewhat rural areas. And um, so to be very secretive here, because actually back, back in the day, even your neighbors would turn you in if you were harboring slaves. It was. Uh, um, quite a, uh, it was against the law to do that. And so what a lot of them did was, they, for instance, that they had a large uh, farm in the or wooded area in the back of the house, close to the house. Um, they would actually um, excavate and dig tunnels. So they, at night, they would be in the woods and then they would go through a tunnel into the cellar of a house and, uh, and stay there until the next night. So we'll go to the next house. This is the Timothy Wadsworth's house, also in Farmington. And um, these houses are uh, still here today, and fortunately, they're uh, very well uh, kept up, and some are actually uh, open to the public. And we'll go to the next house, Horace Cole's house. And you can see this one here would probably be one of the easiest ones to uh, harbor slaves because you've got a lot of trees in the front yard, and uh, under cover of darkness, you could take three or four or, or maybe five or six in the family and uh, bring them right in. What they would do is go from house to house. If it was a long distance from town to town, then the conductors would take them in, uh, in a horse and wagons. They would hide them in the wagons and move from town to town uh, secretively at, uh, at night. And we'll go to the next house. It's Elijah Lewis house. And uh, once again, you've got a large wooded area there in, uh, Farmington, Connecticut. It, it's just amazing to think how many, for, for that many years, how many different fugitive slaves are actually housed here overnight, clothed and fed. Um, and then the next day they, they would move out to go to another area. And um, the, uh, the conductors, of course, would uh, know each, each house, all right? And they would have different signals. Uh, <laughs> In other words, you can't have, a, a, say, a family of um, four slaves, let's say, in the carriage house or in the uh, cellar of a house, and then the next day add another four, uh, another family. So what they would do is they would have signals, and they would do very, very secretive, and the conductors would all know that. For instance, on a, uh, we'll go to the next house. That's the Austin Williams house in Farmington, Connecticut. And that's another one of the, uh, one of the houses uh, what, what they would do is, like here on the front porch, um, the conductors would know the signals and that, for instance, uh, during the day they would probably put a milk can on the front porch and that would uh, signify that we, have, uh, we already have uh, two or three slaves in our house and the next night they would bring the milk can inside the house. So the conductor would go by the house and say, okay, uh, the house is open, it's clear, go in here, this type of thing. Or they would say in the evening they would um, have on one side of the house, all the shaves would be down every night. But in case they, uh, the, the uh, fugitives would move on to another house, then they would move the shades up uh, halfway or stagger them. They, they all of these different codes like that because it was extremely, uh, seemed extremely secretive and it's it certainly quite an operation for the thousands of the uh, runaway slaves. Uh, to go from the south all the way through the north all the way up into Canada. So we'll go to the next slide. And this is at the same house in the back of it. It has a what they call a carriage house where they had the horse and wagon they would keep it in there. And this house here was, a, was excellent there. You can see it's a wooded area and you could house quite a few uh, slaves overnight. Um, it, it was quite, uh, quite an operation back in, uh, in Farmington. And I never knew that. And I don't think any, anyone in my family ever knew that, that uh, Farmington, Connecticut, which was right where I was originally, originally from, Bristol, Connecticut, stone throws away. I, I never knew that this was uh, the 
Grand Central Station of, uh, of, of moving of the Underground Railroad at the time. I'll go to the next slide. Here's a Thomas Hooker house. And these houses in their own right are just, just uh, fantastic. Very, once again, very well kept out, kept up. And, and the amazing thing is that, uh, you know, you take a look at these houses, that's the way it looked during the day. You go through the town of, uh, I read and did some research, town of uh, Farmington, you would never know anyone was uh, hiding in a cellar or hiding in a, uh, a bookcase behind a, <laughs> which they had these floor to ceiling bookcases and a lot of them they put hinges on them and they had uh, they made uh, rooms you, you would swing open the bookcase and behind them there'd, there'd be a room just enough maybe a small room four by six or something like that where they could uh, hide some of the sleighs and uh, so a lot of these houses have a lot of secret passages that uh, some are they the, the owners are just discovering a lot of these today so we'll go to the next slide now, another way to come up in Massachusetts, there would, uh, a lot of um, fugitive slaves, once again, they would come up by ship and they would come into New Bedford Harbor. And this is quite a, quite a picture here. You can see all the uh, sailing ships, all the schooners docking in New Bedford Harbor. And this picture was taken in 1845. So that's right around the, uh, right around the time when, uh, uh, before the uh, Civil War, when this place was just a uh, hustle and bustle type of thing. And at night, of course, they would offload the uh, slaves and then the conductors would take them uh, on their journey north from house to house. So we'll go to the next slide. And one of the famous houses in the Bedford is the Nathan uh, Bedford House uh, in Bedford, Massachusetts. And that's where a slave by the name of Frederick Douglass stayed. And he came up from the south, and he did not uh, go all the way up to Canada from what, what I could discover, but he stayed right here in the house. But he was a um, terrific orator. And he, so he would go from uh, town hall to town hall uh, around New England, uh, making uh, speeches against slavery. And uh, uh, that's, that's the house where he lived in New Bedford. And it's, uh, I believe it's open, uh, open for visitation by, to the public. So he was quite a, a voice against uh, slavery in the North before the Civil War. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, after they came to New Bedford, the, the typical route was at night they would leave some of the uh, safe houses in that area and by horse and wagon, and they would all go to Fall River, Massachusetts. And uh, where I researched, actually one of the, the main houses here in that area, of course we had the uh, Chase House in Rhode Island, was was excellent place for hiding uh, for all the uh, slaves in, in Rhode Island. And of course we had Farmington, Connecticut, uh, that whole town was another uh, station on the Underground Railroad, and now so was Fall River. And this house here, uh, back in the day, was called the William Hill House, Fall River, Massachusetts. And it's now, the, it's on uh, Rock Street, and now it's the home of the uh, Fall River Historical Society. And if, if you go there or visit there, apparently there's a large bookcase and they, <laughs> it's got hinges on it and very secretive. You can open it up and there's a, there's a hidden room right in this house. So it's certainly, uh, certainly something you can, uh, you, you can check out if you visit the uh, Historical Society. And this was the main, one of the main routes uh, coming in from, uh, from Massachusetts. So we'll go to the next slide. And then to Massachusetts, they would work their way up to, uh, this is called a Jackson House. It's in Newton, Massachusetts. So now you see you're, you're heading, heading north now, house to house. Um, that's very, certainly very, very well kept. Kept. And most of these houses now are on the National uh, Historical uh, Records. And we'll go to the next house. William Bowditch House in Brookline, Massachusetts. Now you're heading up towards, uh, towards the Boston area. And there's, they had a special visitor here, and I'll discover that later on, uh, if not this episode and future ep episodes on who they uh, actually uh, uh, held for quite a few days and weeks in, in this house. 
We'll go to the next slide. Liberty Farm, now we're moving north, Worcester, Massachusetts. And this farm was definitely big. Um, when you get into the Worcester area, now you're taking an underground railroad, now you're taking uh, fugitive slaves that, that entered here from uh, Connecticut and they entered here from Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And this was one of the, uh, one of the main stops on the Underground Railroad where you would go. So now you're heading, you're, you're heading north to get out of um, uh, Massachusetts, heading towards Canada. And of course, they did not have the fugitive slave law in Canada, so this was, um, um, that was the ultimate goal. Uh, I've, I've certainly a few of them stayed, some of the slaves stayed as uh, servants, um, that type of uh, occupation, if you will, but most of them were heading out to Canada, and from what I could understand, uh, it was around the Toronto area. So we'll go to the next slide. The Wayside. Now the Wayside is a house in Concord, Massachusetts. Now Concord was another main stop in the Underground Railroad. Now you can see this house, um, I wish I had a um, shot of the backyard, you can see the trees up there in the hill. This was ideal. Now this house you could, uh, you could take the fugitive slaves back in the woods and at night you could see it. it's only uh, maybe six feet from the backyard uh, right into the back of the house. And this was uh, heavily used back, back in the day. And in 1846, the owners of the house um, were actually uh, my descendants. So we'll go to the next picture. Uh, the Underground Railroad Wayside House, Concord, Massachusetts, and the house was owned for two years anyway by Bronson Alcott, and of course Louisa May Alcott was his daughter. And uh, I'm a direct descendant of the Alcott uh, family, and uh, I never knew this existed. That's what's great about uh, all the study and all the research I do. You never know. You always you. Much, much as you think you've done as much research as you can, there's always something new to find, and that's what's exciting. Now, Louisa May Alcott at that time, she was 14 years old. And of course, Bronson was her father, and he was an abolitionist. And in 2001, uh, the Underground Railroad, it's, I, I guess, a, a, a society, uh, they put this uh, bronze plaque on a granite stone right in front of the house as a tribute to the... Uh, Bronson Alcott and Louisa May Alcott. So it's been very well documented um, that this site and was used in the Underground Railroad. So that's actually a part of my history, which I never knew about. Um, we'll go to the next slide. And that's the Orchard House. They, they lived there two years, 1846, 1847, and then Bronson moved to the uh, Orchard House in Concord. He um, uh, liked that area a lot better. And then the Wayside House, I believe, was um, purchased by um, another one of the poets in uh, Concord. I believe it was Nathaniel Hawthorne that purchased that house. So now Bronson's at the Orchard House in uh, Concord, Massachusetts. And I'll go to the next slide. And this I, I found just recently, that once again, these old postcards are uh, very important to, to have. And this was in uh, my family. My mother had this postcard for who knows how many years now. And it was just uh, in an old shoe box. And uh, I found that. And if you take a look at the wagon, it's a picture of uh, Bronson Alcott in Concord, Massachusetts, probably going for a uh, Sunday afternoon uh, carriage ride. And uh, this is quite a, uh, quite a picture for, for uh, historical purposes. I've never seen anything like this in uh, any website, and I've searched quite a few during this, uh, uh, putting together this program. So there's uh, quite a historical uh, photo right there. And we'll go to the next slide. And this is an actual shot. I'm, I'm not sure how they got it in color. They may have... Um, done something with the uh, photograph, but that's an actual picture. At first I thought it was, uh, if you look at it, uh, you get this postcard at the uh, Orchard House, and look, okay, there's a reenactor playing uh, Charles, <laughs> playing Bronson Alcott, and that's all it was, but I looked it up and researched it, and I, oh no, that's his, his actual picture there, and that's his uh, study 
at the uh, Orchard House in Concord. And we'll go to the next picture. And today, if you visit the Orchard House, that's the study. That's what it looks like today. And of course, that is a, uh, I mean, talk about redoing a house for a museum. That Orchard House is just a, just a classic. Um, everything in there is a uh, uh, period to the time. Uh, all of uh, Branson's uh, works, literary works, whatever, they're all in bookcases. Uh, it's it's uh, very well uh, meticulously kept. It's quite a, quite a house. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, on the side of his house, there's this old barn. And a lot of people don't know the uh, significance of this. You know, they go and they tour their um, orchard house and they're interested in Louisa May Alcott, uh, of course, the author of Little Women. And so I asked some of the uh, tour guides there, I said, you know, is there any significance to the barn? And they basically said, yes, there is. I said, well, well, well tell me. I'm from the uh, <laughs> Historical Commission. I'm always interested in history. And, and basically what, 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 the, what they said was this uh, barn was used by Bronson Alcott for adult education classes uh, back probably 1940, 1846 uh, through the Civil War and then afterwards. And in, in the United States history today, um, that is the first adult, adult education house or building in the United States, and that's hard to believe because uh, he was quite a lecturer in Concord, Massachusetts. And so that's, uh, I mean, back then, uh, if you went to uh, finished eighth grade, that was uh, the end of your education, you went to work. Or if you're fortunate enough to finish high school, that was the end of it. And of course, if you were uh, male, you would, uh, uh, and you were very, very um, eager to con continue on, there were a few colleges. And of course, the colleges were not for women back then. But after all that education was completed, there was, there was really nothing existed. And so Bronson Alcott was one of those educators that said, you know, you know there's a lot of people that should have a continuing education and uh, different topics and whatever. And that's where they all came to Orchard House and the barn in Concord, Massachusetts. So we'll go to the next slide. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, John Brown. Um, he's from uh, Torrington, Connecticut. And uh, he was, of course, an abolitionist and more famous for uh, the raid on Harper's Ferry. And we'll go to the next slide. And that's a picture of the uh, John Brown House in uh, Torrington, Connecticut, uh, which is no longer exists. They had a fire there probably in the uh, early uh, or the late 19th century. Burnt it right to the ground. We'll go to the next slide. And he also came to Concord, Massachusetts in March of 1857. Now we're getting close to the Civil War. And he was going from town hall to town hall with the idea of trying to uh, raise money or whatever for his efforts to um, fight uh, slavery that was going on in the South. And uh, two of the prominent poets, if you will, that were there and writers that were there were Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson. And they all listened to his lecture in uh, 1857. So we'll go to the next slide. And what they did is when he came up uh, to Concord. He stayed here at the Ralph Waldo Emerson House. He stayed there overnight, and that house is still there, and you can actually visit that house. And we'll go to the next slide. And there's the town hall meeting, March 11, 1857, and um, that's what the town hall looked like in Concord. So I did some research. I, I'm glad I found that town hall. <laughs> found the picture for this program here so I can get an idea what it looked like. And that's where uh, John Brown was on his first lecture in Concord, Massachusetts. So we'll go to the next slide. And uh, now we're going back to Collinsville, Connecticut. It's called the, uh, the Collins Company. And John Brown, of course, was from Torrington, Connecticut. And I took this picture uh, last year and that building still exists. It's the Collins Company, and it was a foundry. 
And John Brown visited that in uh, uh, 1857, I believe, and he placed an order with the, o the owner of the Collins Company for 1,000 pikes. And the owner said, okay, all right, um, you know, I, I can make those, and uh, I know you very well. You've been here several times, whatever. So the owner uh, started to make uh, all these pikes. And of course, this is uh, once again before the, uh, the Civil War. And that's where the foundry was. The building still exists today. I visited the uh, Historical Society in Canton, uh, Connecticut, and they were helpful to uh, tell me all about the uh, Collins comp Company. So we'll go to the next slide. And Charles Blair was the owner of the co company. And that's a brown pike forging. And that picture, um, they actually had one of those pikes in, at the uh, museum. They uh, took a picture of it, forwarded it to me, so you can see it right now what the pikes were. John Brown, he ordered, uh, he only gave enough money for 500 pikes. He wanted 1,000. And so uh, Charles Blair made the rough forgings on the first 500. And then since he got no money from, uh, from Mr. Brown, he uh, didn't do anything about that. So we'll talk about what happens uh, a couple of years later. And I just want to show this book right here um, that we have here on, uh, on my desk right in front of me. <laughs> um, that's the book where I got the information about uh, uh, Branson Elcott and Louisa May and the, uh, that they were involved in the abolitionist movement in the Wayside House in Concord, Massachusetts. And that's a, quite a book that just came out. Uh, and that's where I've discovered all the information about their involved, involvement in the Underground Railroad and also the, uh, the important monument there. So once again, I hope you enjoyed uh, episode two, a little bit of history a lot, a lot of folks don't uh, realize happened in New England. And I'm trying to bring uh, history to life on uh, discovering New England history. So once again, I'm uh, Dave Norton and have a good afternoon. <laughs>